G'day, it's Preza here, and welcome back to my workshop. I'm sure you've heard of that saying, it never rains but it pours, and that's certainly been the case for me just recently. Now, I've been working on these clocks, and I'm dead keen to get these finished, but unfortunately, I've got a series of cascading house maintenance repair issues that I've had to deal with. Now, I don't want to moan, but here's just a few of them. Now, some time ago, a lot of the guttering on the front half of our house rotted and rusted and needed replacing. And that means getting up on scaffolding and ladders and cutting your hands with ribbons on sharp uh, sheet metal edges. And let me tell you, it's no fun. But I'm about halfway through that repair. And at the same time, we had some very large palm trees that need to be cut down in the front half of the house. And that's because they were getting up taller than the guttering and they were dropping their seeds and the fronds on the roof and in the guttering. So they just had to go. And in order to do that, there was a large wooden flagpole uh, that was in the way and it had to come down as well. Now this flagpole belonged to my grandfather. It's made of bunya pine, which is a soft wood and not particularly durable. And when I got it on the ground, I realized that about one third of the top of the flagpole had dry rot and it was now the consistency of sponge cake. And that meant that uh, the top part of the flagpole had to come off and I had to graft a new piece of timber onto that. And I was almost through that repair and then I realized that there's another patch at the bottom of the flagpole that's equally as bad and needs to be fixed or repaired in some way. Of course, it's one of those things you can't just burn or dump or cut up because everybody says, oh, you can't do that, it belongs to the family. So I'm sort of uh, bound to try to repair it. Now, also belonged to my grandfather was a cane lounge suite. Now, up until recently, this belonged to my sister. She contacted me a little while ago and said, you're good at repairing things, would you like to have this? And when I got hold of it, I realized it was in a pretty poor state of repair. I have zero experience in uh, maintaining or repairing this type of furniture. And clearly it needs a lot of work. So that's another job that's sitting on the veranda waiting for me to tackle it. I've got new spindle bearings waiting to go into the Bridgeport Mill. I bought these about six weeks ago and they've been sitting on the table of the machine and every time I walk past it's like they're mocking me. But it's one of those jobs that you really need to devote uh, an entire day to. Once you get started you can't stop, you've just got to keep going. So although the mill is running it does need the new bearings and I, I desperately want to get on and do that. And speaking of new machines, I also recently got hold of a, a, a second-hand machine, to me anyway. And the only place it could go is in a 20-foot shipping container that I use as a sort of an annex to my workshop. And uh, while I was cleaning up in there and making room for it, I found some patches of damp on the floor. I looked up to the ceiling and realized that there were some serious rust patches in the ceiling of the container. I got up on top, had a look, and sure enough, the, the rust was perforated right through the roof. And there are so many holes, it's just not possible to patch each one of them. So end result is I've had to buy two replacement panels for the roof. Now luckily you can buy replacement panels for a shipping container. In fact, just about every part of a shipping container has spare parts and you can buy them. So I've ordered those and paid for them, but with the lockdown at just at the moment, I can't travel down and get them just yet. But that's another job that's going to be at least two or three days. Now, speaking of the machine that I bought, let's have a look at it. One good thing that came out of all of this was that I was able to purchase this sheet metal guillotine. Now, this came from my former workplace and it was excess to their requirements. They put it up for tender. And to me, it was worth $350, so I put in a tender of that amount. And guess how many people put in tenders? Just me. <laughs> so I could have bought it for a dollar. But the thing is that uh, this machine uh, has capability that I find very hard to replicate with normal hand tools. So if you want to cut very thin strips of uh, sheet metal and stop them from distorting or curling, this is about the only way you can do it. And the good thing also is that the blades on this machine are reversible. So the moving blade in this section here and the fixed blade underneath can be flipped over 180 degrees and you've got a new sharp edge on both. So uh, this is going to live up here in the container because it doesn't need power and uh, I just don't have the room in my shop anymore. Yeah, it's mine now. All right, so this is the part we're going to be making today. So this is a replica pressure gauge. 
but in fact, it's really a thermometer. Now this is the, uh, the piece that I'll be fitting into the replica pressure gauge, and you can buy these from woodworking suppliers, and they're called fit-ups, and these are probably the smallest ones you can get. But you can buy these as a thermometer, a hygrometer, or a barometer, and they're designed to just press fit into a drilled hole in a piece of wood. And there's a sort of a, a silicon rubber seal around the edge of that bezel, and that provides just enough friction to allow you to push that in and it will hold there without any other form of fitting. So the only parts I need to make are this uh, brass stem here, which is from some half inch square brass, and this uh, body here, which is gonna be made from this 2011 T6 aluminium. So uh, let's head over to the lathe and start making the parts. The thread that I'm cutting on here is a model engineer thread, 5 16 by 32, and that's because I have some pipe fittings that match. And there's nothing needs to go through the bore of this part, it's just purely to support the rest of the dial or the gauge. And there's my little coupling. And then later on we're going to put a pipe in there with a flange on the end of it and that'll be trapped by that nut. So we'll part this off now and get on to the body of the gauge. This chuck that I'm using is a four jaw self-centering chuck which is really handy for this sort of work. So we'll just tidy up this face here and that part's done. So this will need some fixing holes drilled in one of these faces later on, but we'll get the, the body of the, the gauge made first and we'll drill through from that. Well, we can get on now and make the aluminium part for the, basically the body of the pressure gauge. And I know what he's saying is, now, hang on, that was longer before when you showed us. And where did all this aluminium scrap come from on the lathe? Well, look, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I've already made one. I wanted to be sure I had the process right before I showed you. And I've also made a Delrin plug that goes inside that so I can turn it around and machine the back. So I get this surface here really smooth and clean and also do that radius or that round on that edge there. So that's sort of a really snug fit. And I've threaded this so I can get that plug in and out fairly easily. All right, so let's, let's do this one now that I know the process.
I'm going to be able to get a flat bottom on this uh, this hole that I'm drilling and and boring. And of course, with the you know, configuration of that drill bit there, I'm really only working to the point in taking the depth of the drill bit. So just having to be a bit careful here. So the total depth that I need to get on this feature is 16. I'm only drilling to 15 and remember that's to the point of the drill. And when I start boring this we're going to have to sort of try and create a flat bottom on that uh, that hole. Which I can tell you now is not easy. So I'm just going to bore out the bulk of the material and then we've got to work on the bottom and get that dead flat. I'm just measuring my Delrin plug here and I'll use that as a gauge. I want to get close to this inside diameter before we start flattening out the bottom. Now you probably can't see it, but what I'm doing is bringing the tip of the, the boring bar just to the centre, advancing the tool. I'm only getting about 0.1 of a millimetre at a time and then bringing it back as if you were doing a basin cut from the centre out. And on my DRR I've got all my numbers set so I know when I'm there. But the chatter is appalling <laughs> and uh, it's just slow. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this off and then we'll come back when I've got the inside diameter done and we got the depth correct. Depth's not all that critical but the inside diameter is. Well, I got the bottom 16 millimeters deep and it's flat and I'm about 0.28 off the, the diameter. So we'll just take another cut, see if we get close. And that's it. The only problem is this stuff is so thin now it just rings like a bell and we're getting a lot of uh, chatter on the inside there but who cares, no one's going to see it. If you're wondering why I was hanging on to the boring bar, I was just trying to deaden some of that chatter. Alright, so for the next operations, after I part off, that's going to stay in there. And that'll give me something to compress the jaws down onto without distorting that part. Now if we've done everything right, this should just press in there. That's it. Just pops in and it's firm enough that it'll just stay there. Alrighty, I'm going to get this parted off and then we'll flip it around and do the back. Now I'd love to say that I'm brave enough to be able to part that right off to the very centre, but my parting tool is not probably long enough. Uh, I don't have enough courage to do that and I don't want to scrap the part at this stage. So I'm going to go as deep as I can or as deep as I dare and then I'm going to take the cheats way out and finish with a hacksaw. But let's pretend you didn't see that, alright? Alrighty, I'm about halfway there and uh, the trouble with this is when things go south it happens very quickly, things get kinetic very quickly <laughs> and yeah, ruin your day. 
So um, yeah, let's finish it off with a saw. Well, there you go, I'm not proud of it, <laughs> but at least we got there. So you can sort of see why I wanted that plug to be in there. So I knew I'd have to do this. I knew I'd have to turn it around and machine the back and also put the, the round on that sharp edge. And if it, you know, if I was just trying to grip this without that plug in there, it would just crush it and distort it. And even as it is now, I'm just going very gently with this. Well there's the finished part with the thermometer pressed into it and the look that we're trying to achieve there is something like a brass part that's been pressed or stamped. And if you were looking at what I was doing there with that sanding on that edge there and you think it was dangerous, yes it is. And you've got to make your own judgment call about whether you're confident enough to do that. Uh, I am okay with it, but there is an element of danger with that. This might seem like a backwards way of doing things, but I'm going to drill the mounting holes in this aluminium cup first, and I'm going to do the same on the brass part that I made that uh, fits into the half inch square slot in the bottom of this part. And I'm using the CNC mill because I can accurately step off from this center point. So I've already centered the chuck on the spindle, and then I can just do my offsets and drill the holes. I'm going to be drilling these holes a clearance size for an 8BA countersunk head screw. And these are very close together, <laughs> so my countersink is going to touch, I know that. So as you can see, uh, probably got it done with those being further apart, but I think it's going to work. I'm going to drill this brass stem here with the same offsets I used on the aluminium cup. So all the holes will line up, I hope.
I've assembled that little brass stem on the outside of this aluminium cup. It needs to go on the inside when it's finished. And I've just got a pair of screws there holding it in place for now. And this is going to allow me to set this up in the mill vise. So I can just drop that down and let that brass piece rest on the fixed jaw. And then we're just going to do that up ever so gently. So we don't crush anything. And then I've got one of these touch point sensors. We're going to use that to find the center of that part. Right, so I'm going to zero X there. So there's our contact point, and then we'll just do the half thing to find the centre. Alright, so that's it there. I've already done the Y measurement, and I've got that set up so that the cutter will be directly over this edge here. So we're just going to use a 4mm carbide end mill now. I'm just going to peck away at that and get the, the dimension that we need. I've got my numbers written down here. Alright, well I've offset 4.35mm to the left in X and we're right on zero. And we're just going to start walking back toward this back face here. Got to go a total of 14mm in Y. going to remove those screws now and then I'll clean up the back face. This top screw here is sacrificial. I knew I was going to damage that one. It's playing hard to get it's funny hearing aircraft flying overhead again. <laughs> a lot of people complained about the altered flight path over this area, but I actually don't mind it really. I like watching the big jets and it's nice to know that things are getting back to sort of normal. Now if everything is good, that should just fit in there, which it does. So we'll clean out the back corner now. I won't bore you with doing all of this, but just using needle files, I'm just going to clean out that rounded corner. And we'll do a bit of deburring. Pretty close there.
that's the general arrangement now and I've got to line up the screw holes in the back there and put the screws in oh that's not bad I'm not going to fully tighten this up yet because it has to come out again the problem is that our little thermometer will bottom out on that brass piece there and what we need to do is cut away some of that material about two millimeters so that we can push the thermometer all the way down and it will engage all the way around the edge of that aluminium cup so I'm going to do that on the mill I won't show you that it's just straightforward milling and then we can fit this up and then we'll do the pipe work and hopefully we're done now you see that milled step that I put in the brass block there and that comes almost to the bottom of this um, cutout section I've just done on the, the mill on the cup and that should allow the thermometer now to just press in and you can see it comes all the way down to the edge of that aluminium cup and I've got the threaded coupling on here now I've got a pipe already made up for this and I won't show you how I did that because I'll come back to that later we'll show that process at a later stage this is going to be powder coated in a matte black and yes these screws are too close together <laughs> I should have allowed more brass coming up inside the cup there, but uh, what can you do? Uh, it, it, it'll work. So, um, yeah, let's go and get it fitted up, put it on the clock. Well, there we are, both done. Now, if you're looking at this and saying that's not correct, yes, you're absolutely right. In a normal pressure gauge set up on a boiler, this steam outlet would come into the copper tube and it would then bend downwards into a 180 degree loop and come back up to the gauge. And the idea of that is that some water will always condense at the bottom of that U-shaped tube and that acts as a heat break and it stops live steam from coming straight up the tube and into the back of the gauge, which is very sensitive. So in fact, that little pocket of water that's there pressurizes just plain air in this section of the pipe here. But this is just a bit of artistic license on my part and I'm quite happy with it. And we're nearly finished for today, but first let's do Culture Corner. Well, in the last episode I challenged viewers to identify the subject that's on my t-shirt today. And there was a gentleman named Daniel, uh, sorry I don't have your last name, but Daniel was the first one in with the correct answer. And of course it's the great Camille Pissarro. Now there were a lot of good guesses, um, some of them were unusual, <laughs> I think we had Walt Whitman, and there were some uh, purely Australian guesses, I think uh, Pat Dodson, Albert Namajira and Ned Kelly. Now there were also some purely artistic guesses and there were some good ones there. We got Claude Monet, which is actually very close and also Leonardo da Vinci. But a little bit about uh, Pissarro, he was uh, born in 1830, died in 1903, and he studied and worked alongside some of the more well-known uh, Impressionist painters. So certainly uh, Monet and Van Gogh were two of them. I also asked people to identify where I might have got this shirt from. Now, as it turns out, it's actually written on the bottom of the shirt. And I suspect there was a bit of that stuff going on that you would have seen in Blade Runner when Deckard is studying a photograph from a crime scene. And, uh, well, it's, it's a bit like this, really. Move in. Stop. Pull out track right. Stop. Enhance 34 to 36. Now the museum itself is in Paris in the 16th arrondissement and the name of the museum is the Musée, Musée, I'm sorry I can't speak French, <laughs> I can barely speak English let alone French. I'm going to read this off a piece of paper. So it's the Musée Marmiton Monet. Now this museum is housed in a large empire style townhouse, absolutely beautiful building and in the basement there's over a hundred of Claude Monet's works. So it's well worth the visit if you're in Paris. So uh, that's it for today. Now I'm going to come back in the next episode. We're going to make some more really interesting parts for the clock. Uh, in fact, we're going to do the one that fits on the other side of the steam dome here. And it's a, it's a really cool little part. Uh, we'll see if we can get it finished and working and lit up. But yeah, that's to come. So please join me for that. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun. So it's Prezzo signing out for now. I'll catch you on the next video.